We're looking forward to this workshop. So this is one of the, the first editions of the um, last net summer, well, I suppose we'll move into fall eventually, summer workshop, um, workshop program. And we're focused on agricultural and forestry investments, land use change and socio-ecological sustainability in Southern and Eastern Africa. And I think we're going to focus on um, Mozambique in this. So uh, my name is, is Channing Arndt, and I'm the director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at, at IFPRI. I you know, happen to have the, the good fortune to begin working in Mozambique in, in 1996. Um, and I, was, I worked there intensively for, uh, you know, from abroad uh, uh, for about uh, six years. And then I became resident at the very end of 2002. And I uh, worked in Mozambique in essentially the Ministry of Plan and Finance for, for six years as their advisor and then, and then worked again uh, for a period of time uh, afterwards. Uh, I actually haven't been in Mozambique for two, three years now. So it's, 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 a, it's a little bit of a, of a return after working um, on Mozambique. So it'll be nice to, to learn more on, on my side. Um, but I, I bring a, a bit of a perspective on Mozambique, which I hope to be able to, to add um, to, this, to this workshop. So um, just to start, this is a program of GlassNet, which you may or may not know. And GlassNet has a not that easy, stands for Global to Local Global Analysis of System Sustainability. And this is essentially uh, a network of networks, and we're going to have people from various networks represented here. Uh, so it's seeking to be a deep integration across scientific teams and, and research communities that are undertaking global analyses. But as, as this, this, this workshop demonstrates, it's not just kind of global analysis that's you know, global. It dives down into a particular region and, and works its way back up. And, and yeah, I agree. I think this is this is the future, and and one of the ways that uh, certainly IFPRI um, would like to go as as well. So um, the idea behind GlassNet is to build a shared vision, harmonize data, deploy model tools, develop the native training for for participants, um, sort of test uh, test workflows to analyze trade offs and synergies in, for example, sustainable development goals and implement sustainable plans, um, plus disseminate across these, these various networks. So um, I will just uh, you know, really briefly introduce the, the speakers and allow them to uh, you know, take off so you don't have to listen to me for very much longer. So we have sort of three principal speakers, um, uh, Patrick Maprot, who is a professor at UC Louvain, in Belgium, and he is a mover and shaker in the Global Land Program. He's working with uh, Delini Abaygunawardna, um, who's a research associate, also at the Leibniz Institute of Agricultural Development and Transition Economies. And finally, uh, the third presenter is Christina Chiarella, who's a postdoctoral researcher also at UC Louvain. Uh, then we have the pleasure of having um, uh, four discussants. And I think we're going to start with Natasha Ribeiro, who is an associate professor at the University of Eduardo Mondlan, uh, which I know quite well. Um, we also have uh, Karsten Meyer, uh, who is head of junior research group in the German Center for Integrated Biodiversity Research. Karsten is also a mover and shaker within LuckyNet and may be able to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, uh, Rui Benfica is a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute and somebody who's done a, you know, a considerable amount of work on land and land issues in Mozambique. Um, your, his, his dissertation is on that, uh, you know, sort of some of these issues. Um, so, so he will, we're looking forward to his comments as well, bringing a local perspective. And finally, we have Justin Johnson, who's an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota and uh, a, a mover within the Natural Capital Network. So that's the, 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 the lay of the land. We're gonna take about 45 minutes to start with for the presentation, I believe. So I will hand, hand over to Patrick right now and um, let you, you and your team um, take off for please, for about 45 minutes, please. And let's try to stay on time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll definitely do our best to stay on time. Um, do you see the screen correctly here? I do. 
Okay. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, so uh, the, um, yeah, the focus of the work today is understanding agricultural dynamics and forests and land use dynamics. And in particular, this uh, through this notion of agricultural frontiers that I'm going to explain in a minute. Um, this is part of the work that uh, we've been doing uh, as part of the Midland project, which is a ERC, so European funded project. You can find a website there with all the details about the project and the publications and, and everything that I'm going to, that we're going to present today is, is on the website there. Um, and it's the work of, of a, a team uh, with many people here. Um, well, number of researchers at the University of Louvain in Belgium, number researchers at the University in Dwarda Mondland in Mozambique, and also colleague elsewhere. Um, you can see that Natasha Ribeiro, who's going to speak after us discussant, is, is here listed, but she mainly contributed to some parts of the remote sensing work. So I think she can provide a, a, a really genuine um, external, but also very insightful <laughs> perspective on the project. Um, a very quick outline of what we're going to explain. I will introduce a little bit the big picture and then um, Delini will talk about the kinds of agents of land use dynamics that we are um, focusing on, which is mainly commercial farmers and investors. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the land use patterns that we observe, mainly to remote sensing and special analysis. And then Christina will discuss the impacts of these dynamics related to changes in farm size and forestry investments. And then we'll, we'll end up with some <coughs> prospects for engagement or reactions also from the broader community. Um, okay. Um, in this work, we are... Uh, investigating the land use dynamics through this notion of resource frontiers that we define as these places with an imbalance between abundant natural resources that can be land and a comparative lack of a scarcity of production factors, which can be capital labor, et cetera, to exploit this resource. And because of this imbalance, it creates a rapid inflow in certain circumstances, a rapid inflow of production factors and expansion of the resource um, use, which can create deforestation frontiers. So those frontiers where the resource is land that is forested and converted to agriculture and is rapidly converted to agriculture, but also commercial agricultural frontier where the resource is land that may be used already for subsistence or service subsistence agriculture and where investors or commercial agricultural uh, operators um, are quickly trying to invest to transform these areas into commercial agricultural areas. Um, why, why it's interesting to explore this in the context of cross-scale uh, interactions, which is the goal of the, the network, because these frontiers are marginal spaces globally. So if you think about the global extent of pasture, croplands, or agricultural lands, compared to the, the rate of, for example, agricultural-driven deforestation, if we focus on this deforestation frontier, this deforestation is really a tiny fraction of a percent of the global agricultural area. So you can very well design global agricultural models that are 99% correct on things like global food production, but really miss what's happening in these frontiers. Although they are places with a huge importance from the environmental point of view, where there's conversion of natural ecosystem with high um, value, but also from the socioeconomic point of view where you have large uh, dynamics related to livelihood change, uh, land acquisitions, etc. cetera. Um, and we showed in a previous work that if you take standard variables from land rent uh, theories, you can predict relatively well the global cropland extent, but these places with expansion of cropland are much harder to capture with these classic land rent variables on the global scale, but they can partly be better explained if you incorporate past frontier expansion. So there is a kind of bad dependence in these frontier dynamics, but also there's emergence of new frontiers in places where it's not always very easy to predict that they would emerge. Um, and what happens in these frontiers is often quite 
messy and it doesn't easily fit into global modeling logic. So this is a study that we are finishing where we show that basically a third to almost maybe up to a half of the tropical deforestation that's happening in the tropics uh, is basically for nothing in the sense that it doesn't result in recorded agricultural areas or production for a range of uh, messy dynamics that happens there. But it means that it's very hard to capture what's happening there um, if you stick only to the kind of agricultural area and production data set that are available um, globally because half of this deforestation or one third of this deforestation is not even, does not even appear afterwards in agricultural records. Um, doesn't mean that, that the decisions in these frontiers uh, escapes all kinds of economic logic either. Um, what we, we, we hypothesized or showed from previous work is that these frontiers dynamic can be created by um, rent capture behavior where some agents may um, or some events may change the possibility of capturing of, of, of rent producing in the land that were apparently not super valuable before but end up becoming more valuable sometimes because these agents do have themselves the capacity to create the source of rent because they have a power to drive road constructions or things like that. And um, this, um, this rent-seeking behavior may explain frontier dynamics. Um, we focus on dry forests because these are highly threatened regions um, and also very understudied regions. So we think that it's important to, to bring some better knowledge in these areas. And um, the general questions that we are trying to answer and that you will see later on, we hope that we have some answers, is um, why is it that at some point in some of these areas, there's not so much that happens, there's a lot of that happens in smallholder semi-subsistence dynamics, but not so much commercial agriculture, not large scale deforestation, and then sometimes something happens and some of these places become rapidly expanding deforestation and commercial agricultural frontiers. So why does it happen? How does it happen? What is the role of these investors that go where there is no commercial agriculture? What is this interactions between these deforestation frontiers and these frontiers of commercial agricultural expansion? They sometimes overlap, but sometimes not. And um, what are the impacts of these frontier dynamics on smallholders? Um, just a very quick uh, few pictures for those who may not have these kind of places in mind. So this is Northern Mozambique, uh, Miombo woodlands. So it's dry, open woodlands. It's a region where you still have quite large areas of forest woodlands, but also densely populated agricultural landscapes, um, which can be relatively dry, which can be wetter and more productive. So you have a wide variety of, of landscapes there. Um, so this is the very broad introduction. I hope the scene is set well enough. And now I give the word to Delini for continuing on um, explaining you who are the investors and commercial agricultural agents who are driving these frontiers. Can you see my screen? Oh no. Yes. That's yes. Not the it's there. Uh, but now we're seeing it in, we're seeing the wrong mm. one. We're seeing the, we're seeing the screen, 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 not the, the presentation. Say there it again. A, what are you seeing? Now we just see the slides. Now we just see the slides. We go to presentation mode. Okay. Do you see the presentation mode now? Yeah, but we no. see the speaker's view. Right. Maybe you can, there's a button to switch this or from this. You need to switch to displaying a different screen. So this one? No. no I see the, the oh, I think the display screen. setting. It's Patrick, the, can you just continue with the same, with your slides? Um, 
you think it's okay, Delini? Yeah, you... okay, let's let's do that. Okay. Yeah, sorry, maybe for the transitions. Um, you have to stop sharing then if if I have to okay. share. Okay. Hmm. Um, coming back now. <laughs> okay, so you just tell me when you shift slides. Okay, sorry, I'm having a few problems here. Are you not seeing the slides? Yes. Um, okay. Okay, so I think I now see the slides. Um, so I would have to ask Patrick to change the slides, right? Okay, um, so okay, so um, Patrick gave you the background, uh, the big picture of why we are studying these frontiers. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I will just present you two studies. Um, one that looked at um, frontier making, how and why, uh, the work that was led by Angela Cronenberg Garcia and another study where we looked at who invests where and why. So in the first study um, where we looked at frontier making, how and why, uh, it was really focused on Nyasa, um, um, part of uh, Northern Mozambique, what's in red, you see. Uh, and the other study, it, 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 it was at a larger scale, we did it over actually five countries, but the paper, this particular paper is focused only on four countries. So Ethiopia, Tanzania, Zambia, and Mozambique. So next slide, Patrick. Okay, so um, to um, start with, because you already got the, uh, the big picture, I thought we'll just get to the thick of it and look at what are the key findings of these studies. Um, and also before everyone gets uh, bored and uh, we don't, if, unless we have the time to get to this uh, slide later state at a later stage. So one of the things uh, that we found was that this frontier making pro process is rather protracted. It could be, um, there could be multiple attempts to open the frontier and there is, uh, over, over these multiple attempts, you see that uh, a layering of social, human and physical capital. And one needs to kind of um, see this uh, in the light of what's already established about uh, frontier making. Pa Patrick already mentioned this um, a little bit, this idea of frontier making as a exogenous process where you have lots of external factors. And it's also a rapid process where you see a lot of things happening um, in, a, in a very short time span. So basically the resource being consolidated. But the work that Angela did in Northern Mozambique, what it really suggested, it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a frontier as yet, but the emerging frontier, it, 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 it unfolded over a long time. So, and another key finding that we have is that uh, there is a range of investors, a diversity of investors who have multiple purposes. Again, um, if you look at the, the, the established knowledge, we know that, especially in the case of Africa, we hear a lot of uh, in, in the literature that the, the dominant narrative is about the land grab and these um, um, what you call these institutional investors. So what we find is that there is a, there are a range of investors, not just those institutional investors that the uh, land grab literature is focused on. And another major thing is that across the four countries that we looked at, we see that much of the landscape is uh, kind of um, still in a pre-commercial uh, emerging agricultural frontier state. So not so much, it has not reached this, this, this frontier stage where we kind of talk about a lot of opening up. Uh, although there is a lot of discussion about this happening uh, soon after the 2007-8 uh, food and financial crisis, you saw a lot of investments, you also saw a lot of literature published on this, but we do not see that much opening up happening across Africa. And another important finding is that 
it, it relates to the location of agricultural production. So we have many theories. We do know about von Thunen's theory. We don't know, know about Ricardo's theory. And then there have been other additions to these. So we do know that market prices, market policies, resource availability, resource access, these, all, these are all things that um, help define um, um, or deter determine the location of agricultural production. But what we find is that investor track record is also a key determinant in, in, in defining where people would invest. And in the same light, we see that when you look at these lists of what are the determinants of agricultural production, location of agricultural, uh, agricultural productions, you might think that it's the same list. Of course, it's the same list, but what's interesting is for different investors, uh, these lists, uh, the priority they assign to this, uh, these different determinants vary. Patrick, moving on to the next slide. So here, just a quick overview, just to say that these, these areas that we are looking at, are, uh, as Patrick said, these are kind of resource frontiers. So you do see a lot of forested area. If you look at the last column, like the proportion of forested area is quite high. And you do see that these are areas where there's a lot of poor people and the rural population is high, but also, although I do not have the, um, the numbers here, the, the population density in these areas uh, are low. So you'll have to trust me on this because I'm traveling and I did not manage to unload the um, map layers. So moving on to the next slide. So I'll start with the first study that I mentioned about, so um, how and front, how uh, emerging frontiers sort of unfolds. This work was led by Angela, Angela Coronberg Garcia, and so uh, these are some of the pictures from the field work that she did, and the, the, the lady that you see in the middle picture talking to the gentleman in blue is Angela. So what she did was she spoke to a lot of um, investors and commercial farmers who are operating in um, um, northern Mozambique, in, in Nyasa province in particular, and she conducted around 70 open-ended interviews. And these in and on top of these interviews, she, because this was a thick ethnography, she stayed at farms, um, visited factories, so took part in these various um, village gatherings where they did um, land alienation and all sorts of things. So there was a lot of interaction and um, thick engagement with the, um, with the communities. Moving on to the next slide, Patrick. So, Okay, so this is where a transition would have helped. But in any case, the idea was that what, uh, what, what Angela focused on was to sort of look at what happened uh, in, in the unfolding of the Nyasa frontier over the history. And she framed it in two concepts, so waves and legacies. What she said was like, uh, or what she's saying is that uh, there were multiple attempts to consolidate or let's say not consolidate, open the frontiers, but all of some, but these waves also failed. But most of most people look at this as a failed front frontier. But what happened was that e with each wave, uh, you see that there was some what she calls legacies left behind. So the next wave, what happened was would build on these previous legacies. So now without the transition, let's just focus on the first column. So uh, the first recorded company, the Niasa company was established in 1891. And you see like in the, in the last row in purple, uh, you see that it's it's already also although it was a long time ago it, that's kind of where you see uh, the the recorded sort of history of some of these legacies infrastructure and uh, technical know how left behind um, by some of these by this company and the next few columns that's uh, in 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 light font is actually there for you to not for you to know what it is but for you to know that we know what it is so basically it's just saying that. Uh, in between that time, some of the interesting things that happened was uh, a couple of wars, and uh, in that and 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 there was also some establishment of state farms. Although the legacies were a bit left behind during that time, you also saw a lot of decline in these uh, resources, especially infrastructure and the know-how that was left behind because people also left this time. 
And then we come to the real, to the three waves that Angela talked about, the, 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 the one that was uh, brought about by the Christian missionaries, the African farmers, and then the large scale forestry companies. So in the, in the blue row, the second row, what you see is that these uh, waves were brought in by different reasons or uh, different purposes. The missionaries really came there because of faith. They wanted to establish Christianity. And, 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 and one reason why they selected this area was because it was very isolated. And then you see that in, when, when in 1996, in the second wave, when the Africana farmers uh, arrived, it was really a um, um, agreement between the two governments, African South African government and the Mozambican government. Uh, and that was also rather the Africaners moving away from South Africa, looking for their independence, and then also looking for land. And in the in the in the last one, the, the 2005, the forestry wave, you see that it was it was really driven by one of the bureaucratic organizations called Malanda that was established at the time, and they were really uh, kind of selling the land, that saying that. Okay, there's a lot of land, you can come and um, uh, do your plantations here. And what's inter very interesting that Angela talks about in, in what you see in the, in the last row in purple is that it, with each wave, it has left uh, some um, sediments as she call it, or uh, legacies where uh, each, where the, 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 the next respective wave built on. So what's one might say that this is what happens over history, but what's interesting is that that what you see is that each successive wave really targeted what was happening in the previous wave. And that's why it's really important. It's not, it was not just something random. So moving on to the next uh, slide, Patrick. So here it's just another representation of the same concept, but it's just saying that there, are, there can be multiple attempts to open the frontier, but some of these could fail, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the whole frontier making process would stop at that particular time, but it will continue to unfold over time. But how it would unfold in the future, whether it would become a consolidated frontier, we do not know, but it's just that we do see a lot of layering happening there. So next slide. So then we move on to the second um, um, study, which was done at a much more larger scale. So this was, uh, carried out in four countries, as I said before, and it was an attempt to model the decision-making process of transnational agricultural and um, forestry investors. So what we did was it was a mixed method approach. I will go into detail later if you are interested. And we did more than 95 interviews. Uh, and then uh, with, uh, in, in, so these um, investments were located in like 121 um, locations and it included 37 investments operated by 29 investors. And another key factor is that because you were asking the investors, why do you come here? Why did you invest in this particular crop? And why did you choose this particular location? It was important for us to talk to the top level decision makers. So this was something that was different about this study from other studies that were carried out. So we really spoke to the, um, the CIOs, CI, CEOs, and the managing directors of these companies, but also to the, to the, to the ground level managers and country uh, Level managers. Moving on to the next slide. So, we developed uh, a conceptual model to do uh, model the decisions of these investor investors. What we did was we built on the the the, the theories that we already know. For example, Wonton and Ricardo, who already tells us that uh, that the location of agricultural production is based on either. Um, um, market accessibility or the type of crop or um, agricultural suitability. And on top of that, we combine the location theory of FDI. So the foreign direct investments, you have Dunning's uh, eclectic paradigm there. You, he talks about um, the, the, the only Oli, Oli framework and one of the, 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 the components of that framework is ownership advantage. So that's where we brought in the investor track record. So what it, investor track record represents is whether an investor 
has the skill set and whether he or she has the product market reach. And uh, as the skill set, we looked at sort of whether they have done farming in similar types of crops before or whether they have done some sort of farming, whether they have been working in Africa. And in terms of product market reach, for example, if they're growing macadamia, the, the idea was, do you already uh, have an established market to sell uh, macadamia either to the local market or the, uh, the, 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 the international market? So... Uh, down there, what you see is just, I'm not going to go into the details, but what you see is just the descriptive stats of the sample. And you see that the sample is kind of very heterogeneous, that, that, that they, they do have different skill sets and product market reach. Next slide, Patrick. Okay. Again, so what you see on top is, um, is a typology that we define. So first we have this idea of, okay, what does the decision-making process look like? And if we go one slide back, Patrick, just to have a quick look, the, 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 the last uh, um, one of the nodes, the, 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 the outcome variable of those nodes is the investment location. So going back, going to the next slide again. So here, what we did was we defined four different investment locations depending on two different gradients. So one is a resource frontier gradient and another is an agglomeration economic gradient. Resource frontier, Patrick already defined what it is, so I'm not going to go into the details. Agglomeration, we defined it as, um, as, 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 as a firm having scale economies internal to the sector, but uh, external to the firm. So it's, it's really a measure of scale economies. Um, and then the four categories that we defined, um, it's basically looking at if, for example, if you see the, the, the frontierness, let's say, and agglomeration economies, if they're low in, uh, in these in in both these gradients um you see that it's 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 a populated smallholder land so again in terms of probabilities just for you to be able to uh, read it easily the darker it is the low probability it is and if you go to the other end of the spectrum established market is where you have very little resource but a lot of agglomeration. And in between, you get the frontier condition. So the frontier condition is you basically need to have the resource if it's a frontier, that's the, the definition. And how the two uh, frontier conditions, the subsistence and the emerging, we separated was if it's a su subsistence frontier, there is still resource, but you have less um, agglomeration. In the emerging uh, commercial frontier context, there is also a, a, a little bit more agglomeration happening. So uh, to model this, we used, um, uh, to model the resource frontier, we used two variables. So, so it's, it's, it's really basically to a certain extent dependent on what data was available. So land cover and population density and to model that recommendation economies, we used market influence data. And so basically market access data and then uh, field size data. So, and then, uh, we combine these data sets in a Bayesian uh, model. And for those who do not know uh, about Bayesian networks, all the, all the wonderful, all the, all the magic happens with this equation that's, uh, that's down there. So it's a simple equation, but, so, but a very powerful one that says like, if you take, um, um, so given a certain set of variables, uh, which you might say as evidence uh, denoted by E, you could just predict uh, um, its outcome based on the conditional probabilities. So what you do is like you have a bunch of um, a bunch of parent variables and a bunch of ch child variables, and uh, at each node we calculate uh, what the conditional probability, and then uh, we output uh, a joint probability for the whole network. So moving on to the next slide, Patrick. So here yeah, I'm not going to go into the detail, but just for you to show you that what you see on the right-hand side, the big network with lots of arrows is, 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 is the output of the uh, implemented Bayesian network. But it's just to show you that it's basically implementing the conceptual model that you are seeing on the, on the, uh, the left-hand side. Moving on to the next slide, Patrick. So here, uh, now moving on to the results. So basically, again, on the uh, left-hand side, what you see is, again, a bunch of descriptive stats. 
uh, looking at, I'm sorry that this was supposed to come up big, but uh, the, 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 the criteria that the investors told us as to why they invest in different places. So basically you see that land accessibility, agroecology, market proximity, those are the things that came up high. On the right hand side, what you see is an output of the Bayesian network. And here you see an interaction between uh, these different criteria that the investor said uh, gave us as to why they chose that particular place. And then uh, going back to the model, uh, the type of crops they grow and how um, skilled or the, 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 basically their track record, how skilled and how much market uh, um, accessibility, sorry, market uh, reach they have. So what you see is on the first column, you see where you see um, UNC that's unconditioned. You see that uh, that e each and every variable has some reading, but the moment you start to condition on these different conditions, so the HVC at EXT is that those who grow high value crops with extensive experience. So you see that they only um, prioritize certain variables. And the next one is other agriculture with limited uh, um, experience. And the next one is forestry with uh, extensive experience. So I'm just going to leave it at that because the idea is just to show you that they have different preferences. So going to the next slide. And here again, what you see is um, on the left-hand side, um, it, it, it's, it's a measure of the shift of uh, uh, the investment, the likelihood of investment location uh, uh, where, uh, as an interaction with these uh, different uh, crop types and production, um, sorry, production types and um, experiences. So again, you see, for example, the one that's uh, boxed in blue, you see it's high value crops with extensive exp uh, experience. You see that they're more likely to uh, invest in the subsistence frontier and less likely to invest in the populated smallholder land. And if you look at the red one, those are the investors with little experience and they are more likely to invest in the emerging commercial frontier, which means that they are more likely to invest in places that are, there's more market, market accessibility. So that what you see on the right-hand side is just, just a reminder for you to remember what, what these subsistence and emerging commercial frontiers are. Moving on to the next slide. So here what we did was uh, we extracted those four uh, spatial variables that I told you about, population density, market access, field size, and forest cover, and then ran it also um, uh, using the same Bayesian uh, model concept to look at what are the, uh, what, what are the, so basically if you take a grid cell, what's the likelihood of that grid cell uh, falling into one of the four different uh, um, investment location categories that we talked about. So basically on the left-hand side, you see the different four, four different, uh, the, 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 the distribution of the four different uh, investment location categories. And what's uh, boxed in red is just showing you, if we go back one slide before Patrick, again, it's just, the subsistence frontier where you see um, people who are more likely to invest there are the ones with uh, little um, uh, experience and moving forward. You see that the, 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 the case study that we spoke about before in Angela's case in, in, in North, Northern Mozambique, you see that it's, it's, it's more of, 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 of in, in this state. And the other blue boxes, it's more in the uh, emerging and established market condition. And uh, if we go back one slide before, so you see that they are more likely, the investors who are more likely to invest, they are the ones who um, have uh, more experience. So going forward, uh, the slide, that, um, sorry, the panel that you see on the, uh, Right-hand side is an uncertainty score, so basically just running those same values just to see how uncertain the, what we predicted on the uh, on the left-hand side is. So basically, it's Shannon Wiener index um, again, um, the, the, using the Bayesian output and running a Shannon Wiener index on that. So moving on to the next slide. So with that, I guess 
I hope I told you how we arrived at those four um, conclusions that we arrived at. So the idea that frontier making can be protracted and that uh, there could be multiple attempts to open it and that you see that this layering of social, human, physical capital over time, the investors are multiple and diverse, their purposes are multiple and diverse, and um, much of the uh, much of Africa is in a pre-commercial emerging frontier state. If you want to, we could go back to the previous slide and see, but I guess you would already remember what it is. But then also that this location of agricultural production is really based on uh, the things that we already know, but also um, in the sensitivity analysis, we realized that it's, it's really um, more sensitive to investor tra track records and uh, the selection criteria that the investors told us than to the crop type. And then again, you see, you saw that these different investors sort of um, prioritize different um, um, criteria. So I guess with that, I will stop and give the flow back to Patrick. Thanks. Um, you still hear me well? Yeah, I hope. Um, okay. So um, continuing the, the work, I mean, it's done in parallel, but we, okay, because um, uh, Angela's and Delini's work that you've heard about now were based on qualitative data or a sample of farms. And we were willing to, to see if we, we were actually able to map wall to wall these land use dynamics that, that we've just heard about. So large scale investment, large scale forest replantations. So I will try to be relatively brief on, on this, but this is a lot of remote sensing work that, we, we've, uh, that we're still doing um, in a region that is highly challenging for remote sensing activities. Um, so uh, in the first study, we mapped large scale croplands or large scale farm investments in a small, well, in a large, but in a, one district in the, the north of Mozambique, in Gure district in Zambezia province. Um, there we show that, that actually there's a lot of discourse and there's a lot of impacts also, and a lot of policy um, debates, et cetera, around these large scale investments. But they are still, in fact, a relatively tiny footprint of the landscape. So 1.2% of the area of the district um, that we map were these large scale farms. Um, oh, sorry. Um, we, we expanded the study to the four provinces of the north of, of Mozambique, but they're focusing on large scale tree plantation investment, which is the most extensive large scale commercial land use in the region. And um, we show there that here again, in fact, these tree plantations are still a relatively tiny uh, footprint in the landscape, but still with huge impacts indirectly. So directly, because most of them expand on cropland that were used by smallholders, but also indirectly through driving changes in infrastructure in the socioeconomic context, et cetera. Um, and we'll return to that uh, later on. But this is just to, to, to tell you that at some point we try to, to match these insights that we have from the agents into insights on the, the land use dynamics. And uh, from that, we, we also wanted to get a better insights on the dynamics within the smallholder land use, which are, of course, still the, the one single dominant agricultural uh, land use in the region, trying to map active cropland, but also short fallows, which are often neglected or in, inaccurately measured in remote sensing mapping. Um, so this is a work from another uh, postdoc, Philippe Ruffin, who mapped these um, yeah, active cropland and short fallows and trying to, to at least show that uh, we can make a relation between the, the, the the level of consolidation of agriculture, so the percentage of cropland in the region and the amount of short fallow. So the more agriculture you have in the landscape, the more higher proportion of short fallows you have, presumably because in the areas where agriculture is a lower part of the landscape, you have more longer fallows, which are woody and thus not detected in this area. And so the work that we are doing now is we, we want to still to be able to map these large scale field crops and agriculture wall-to-wall -wall across the region, but it's 
even more challenging than what we've done for tree plantations. So what we're doing now is returning to field, uh, to, to object segmentation algorithms to try to map the agricultural fields one by one. Um, and this is still ongoing work, but I show you a, a little bit of preliminary findings where you, you see this huge contrast between a few pockets of very large capitalized agriculture, like you have in these pivot uh, irrigation system there, just next to extremely tiny smallholder fields um, there. Um, so uh, a little bit on the kind of land use dynamic analysis that we did based on these maps. Um, first, one thing that we showed is with the, our map of tree plantation is that the cadastral records of these tree plantations are highly inaccurate. So uh, around 40% of the tree plantations that we identify by remote sensing fall outside of existing land title boundaries. So it's a reminder for all the studies that use cadastral records as measure of large scale investment and their footprint in the landscape that there's often a discrepancy between the two, at least in this context. And we were trying to match these um, maps of tree plantations with the, the insights that we had from the previous works on waves and legacies, and especially the importance of former state farms that were hubs of uh, previous waves of investments. Um, and, and we Okay, this is the results of a matching uh, statistical matching analysis that I don't have the time to explain, but basically which shows that that is what you have on the, the right hand side, that the proximity to former state farm seems to have a strong effect on the presence of tree plantations. So these tree plantations seem to be especially attracted to locating relatively close, but not too close to these former state farms, which have uh, had roads, electricity, buildings, sometimes irrigation systems. So all the kind of things which, which favor this kind of investment. So it's a kind of statistical manifestation of these legacies that we uh, saw about. And we looked at the effect of community lands policy on investments, I would be happy to talk more about this um, in the discussion um, because it's an important policy in the region, especially related to smallholder to large scale agriculture interactions, but I will, I will not um, talk about this a lot now. Um, and so I will give the floor to Christina for um, saying a little bit on the impacts on farm size dynamics and these interactions between smallholder medium uh, scale holders and large holders and forestry investments. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, so moving on with the studies. Uh, now we show, I'm gonna present briefly the um, results and ongoing work of two different studies. One on evaluating the dynamics with farm size and the other one on evaluating the impacts of forestry investments on small holders. So if we move one slide, Patrick, please. Okay, so um, the first study is, um, looking at the trade-offs between uh, um, land productivity, labor productivity, and labor intensity with farm size. So basically we motivate this work um, describing how within the sustainability debate and in the long run assessments, there are typically two variables that are often weight. Um, so on one hand, we have uh, land sparing in outcomes or um, some sort of efficiency in the production of food that also aims to decrease the environmental impacts. And so such outcome can be captured in an indicator of land productivity, right? Uh, and on the other hand, we have um, weighed with this some social equity outcome um, in the form of farmers' earnings, for example, that can be effectively captured in indicators of labor productivity. And so as an example of this, uh, you can see within the sustainable development goals, these two variables are, are often mentioned. But what happens when we prioritize these two outcomes um, exemplified in land productivity and labor productivity, because they are part of an identity uh, where the third dimension is labor intensity or labor demand, the number of workers per hectare, what happens is that labor demand is treated de facto as an adjustment variable, right? So on maximizing or on um, weighing these other two variables, uh, we are letting labor intensity freely to adjust um, 
to the other two, uh, two variables, right? So um, the goal of this study is to argue that labor demand should be given explicit consideration both within long run assessments and within the, the public debate or policy debate on sustainability. And so for that, we, we describe how farm size is a key variable in determining this, uh, this trade-offs between these three variables. So we start by showing uh, these graphs here where we take a global data set, which basically uh, standardizes national household surveys. And we take um, evidence for 32 countries. This is FAO data. And by the way, this is joint work with Patrick Devini and Piero Conforti from FAO. Um, so we, we take this, this joint data for 32 countries and evaluate the relationship of each of these three dimensions with farm size. And so basically we confirm the, I mean, what it's already known, but we do it for a, such a large um, scale globally. Uh, we confirm the, for example, first in these two panels, A and D, the inverse relationship between farm size and land productivity. Basically that smaller farms are more productive, but we also find a nonlinear relationship and we find um, the switching of this relationship at 11 hectares. So meaning that farms that are below 11 hectares, um, the inverse relationship holds for farms that are below 11 hectares after which the relationship turns and becomes positive. Uh, for labor productivity, uh, we find that larger farms are more labor productive, right? more output per hectare. Again, the relationship being uh, non-linear. But again, as we know, uh, larger farms are also less labor intensive. Uh, they hire or use less, less labor per hectare than sm uh, smaller farms, right? Um, next slide, Patrick, please. We do the same with uh, technical efficiency. And so in the graph, you see the coefficients of farm size on the inefficiency function. So meaning that larger farm size are for the most part, for most countries, more technically efficient. Um, so, um, I mean, all of this to argue that farm size is indeed a key key variable to consider where think, when thinking about these trade-offs, but it's not the sole variable, of course. So we try to demystify that. And then uh, next slide, Patrick, please. We move beyond the farm level and discuss based on the prior evidence and meter to review, um, which other variables, contextual variables are also key when prioritizing within this trade-off space. So the uh, factors that you see listed in this diagram are some of the factors that, or are the factors that we identify as key when deciding uh, or, or when thinking about how the contextual, um, the context matters so much on what to prioritize within this trade of space. And again, the goal is to argue that uh, labor demand shouldn't be left um, freely to adjust, but should be given explicit consideration as the other two important outputs. Uh, so Christina, let me jump in and just say just uh, three more minutes, please. Yes, yeah, I will just finish. Uh, I will just present the second study uh, very quickly. So. That's at the global scale, and we move to Mozambique, and this is ongoing work. We are we are trying to evaluate the impacts of large-scale forestry investments on neighboring small-scale agriculture. So this is connecting with what Patrick presented before. He showed the maps, uh, remote sensing maps of forestry plantations, which are basically a census of uh, the forestry investments that are in northern Mozambique. Uh, and so again, the, the impacts of these forestry investments are still contested in the literature, right? We may have positive effects such as um, employment of the local population, uh, market access opportunities and uh, possibilities for area expansion, or we may have also some negative effects uh, such as not the expected employment effects or risk of higher land prices and uh, premature displacements of smallholders. And although this, there are many studies that are looking at this now, it's still not so um, ubiquitous, mainly because the data is the data both on for on investments and on 
on small holders is hard to get, right? But we take advantage of uh, a combination of the census that Patrick presented uh, with household data. And so what we are working on is on evaluating the effects on employment and productivity of smallholders that are nearby these forestry investments, basically with a regression discontinuity design, um, evaluating the, the exposure to these investments around each household and using a regression, sorry, a difference in difference approach to evaluate the changes in the impacts from a period of 11 years from 2007 to 2017. And I give it over to Patrick for the final remarks. Okay. Um, so, uh, yep. Um, okay. Just um, a short recap, but I, th I think you have um, all the points that we've been through in mind. Uh, you see that that all cross-scale approach is often based on some kind of patchy combination of works at different scale, more than a very neat, uh, totally integrated formal. Uh, cross-scale method, um, but we, we have explored um, why sometimes there is relative apparent stagnation of the commercial dynamics and the frontier dynamics in some areas and then acceleration in link with these past waves and legacies and the building progressively of agglomeration economies. Um, we showed that, that these investors have very different motivations and profiles um, and that uh, we can actually map these uh, dynamics of deforestation frontiers, the commercial frontiers, sometimes they interact when uh, investors drive directly land use expansion of commercial agriculture into forest, but there's also indirect dynamics where uh, a lot of these commercial agriculture expands into smallholder agriculture, and then there's a possible displacement of these smallholders in the deforestation uh, frontiers. And we're still working on the impacts and on the link uh, with policies. So uh, just to open up a little bit the, the discussion, I'm sorry, we're a bit over time, but um, we had thought about a series of things that uh, could be next steps of the work and could be discussed with the Glassnet community. Um, so building some scenarios Patrick, of future. Patrick, this yes. is Channing. Let me let me interrupt. Let's okay. switch okay. over to Natasha just yeah. because she has to drop off. Yeah, I'm and sorry. So for she that, has but... some, and then we can go to you for the maybe the next after the after the the part of the comments at the at the end. But let's roll through because now we have the, the, the speakers. So Natasha, would yes. you please? Thank you so much. And sorry, Patrick, for rushing you. But as you know, I have another meeting in 10 minutes. Yeah. And yeah, sorry. Uh, OK, thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Natasha Ribayu uh, from the Eduardo Online University. And I would like to focus my discussion or my argument on the, the relationship between the agricultural um, uh, expansion and uh, the conservation of natural ecosystems, especially, well, it's biodiversity, but also the ecosystem services provided to most of the people in the region. And I'll focus these on the Mio mode lands where I work the most, I've been working for the last 20 years. Uh, so just for those of you who don't know about the Mio mode lands, it's uh, in green, the top, the bottom uh, to the left uh, map. It's the map of the woodlands in, in Southern Africa. And the greenlands are the, the Mion woodlands. So as you can see, it's the largest um, uh, woodland in, in the region with 1.9 uh, million uh, square kilometers and across seven uh, countries. And the top uh, map on the, on the right, as you can see, is comparing the Miombo uh, with other dry tropical uh, forests in the world. And you can see it's a huge uh, extension uh, worldwide. So uh, it's really important in Mozambique if it's 60% of the forest land it's covered by the Mian borderlands. Uh, so I'm a forest ecologist. So I work mostly on um, uh, the ecology, the disturbances in the relationship with disturbances and the ecology of Miambo. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the, the, the in-depth in about the ecology of the Miongo, but it's highly diverse, both in terms of flora and fauna species, and it's highly related to disturbances 
uh, and when we talk about disturbances, we can't uh, really uh, ignore people living in the Miombo woodlands for, for centuries now, right? So we call these woodlands uh, social woodlands because they really have been uh, with an intimate relationship with people for over 200,000 years uh, in providing goods and services for not just rural population, but also urban population. So there's these intrinsic intimate relationships, as you can see here, honey, charcoal, lab for the culture. And some of these resources are really uh, the main source of nutrition for people uh, during the dry season, for instance, or droughts. So they rely on the forest uh, resources to uh, support their livelihoods. So this interaction is really uh, important. But as we all know, we are the poorest countries in the world, as you can see here from the Human Develop uh, Development Index. But we are also uh, very vulnerable to uh, ongoing climate changes, uh, as you can see also from this map. So we are the region I is in red, right? So really, we all know, again, that socioeconomic growth is a key. Uh, there are several uh, sectors and subsectors in the region, uh, like mining, infrastructures, and others. We, which are key to, to the socioeconomic development, but uh, for sure uh, agriculture and forest plantations are uh, one of the most important um, sectors in the, in the region. So here the challenge is how to uh, keep on providing these resources to local communities, rural and urban communities, but also at the same time develop uh, the region. Uh, so this comes to uh, the question on uh, what type of agriculture we want uh, in the region, right? So in this slide, uh, we have the figures. So to feed our population, we need to increase uh, the cropland by 2050. Uh, so what the type, uh, what's the type of uh, agriculture we want? So on the left, you have the shifting cultivation, as you can see from the mid to low resolution uh, satellite images, you probably see it as an intact landscape with small plots of shifting cultivation uh, embedded in it. You can see it on the satellite. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, you have the commercial agriculture, as Patrick and colleagues have uh, shown. So it's a complete change on the landscape. And in the middle, in the middle it's something uh, like uh, a, 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 mid, a midway between the, the, the left and the right. So, which will be the smallholder intensification in which you, you have the agricultural fields, but you still keep some of the landscape features, as you can see, the riverine uh, areas and also some patches of uh, natural forest, which again are important to sustain the livelihoods of these uh, the local communities. Okay. Uh, so this type of agriculture has been tested in some of the of the, the countries in the region, and I'm sure Patrick and colleagues know about that. Mm -hmm. So Zambia has been, I, I guess, a champion in testing these uh, changes in the in the type of farming systems. Okay, and based on the on the the, the I mean the the, the the information from Zambia. Uh, Estes and its collaborators in 2016 have shown that there's, it's, there's, a, there's a still a, um, a possibility of um, uh, finding a, a midway, a trade-off between the, the different types of farming systems. So as you can see on the graph here, you have the land use intensity from shifting cultivation to the intensive commercial, commercial agriculture. And then uh, on towards the right, we have different uh, ecosystem services from provisioning to uh, carbon uh, emissions and then uh, and other impacts, environmental impacts, and also uh, biodiversity. Uh, so as you can see, there's trade-offs again, you can uh, slightly uh, uh, increase the, the, the yield, the agricultural yield by intensifying smallholder um, uh, farming systems, right? And at the same time, have uh, like um, uh, an equilibrium uh, with other uh, ecosystem services. So, with uh, Estes in, in their study in Zambia, they said that uh, you can compromise only 5% of the yield, but you gain on other uh, ecosystem services. So, that was done for Zambia, as I said. So, it will be interesting to conduct a study like that in other uh, 
uh, countries in, in the Niambo region. Uh, once, one thing we know from our studies is that the Niambo is a very resilient, one of the most resilient ecosystems in the world. So after shifting cultivation in 10 years time uh, to 15 years, you can have a stand, as you can see in this picture, uh, a regrowth stand, uh, which is uh, quite uh, uh, good. So, so we, we can, with management, we can increase the growth uh, to up to 1.4 centimeters per year. Okay, especially if it, this is after shifting cultivation, charcoal production, and timber harvesting, since they leave reproductive material on the field. So it's just for sprouting and root uh, uh, sprouts that um, uh, regrow in the area. So it's possible to do some kind of management. Uh, uh, after shifting cultivation or the intensive smallholder uh, scale uh, agriculture. Uh, just to finalize, so there's some uh, key issues. Uh, so when we try to develop these uh, agricultural options uh, for Africa, just to summarize what uh, I just said. So you can sacrifice a bit of the, the agricultural yield, but then you still get, you know, just 5% as shown in Zambia. Uh, it prob it's probably different in other countries, but uh, uh, they, they pretty much similar. They can be pretty much similar to a large commercial uh, agriculture. Okay, so with that, you sacrifice a bit the the, the yields, but then you you come with a, a situation in which the non-crop products, as I said, important not just for livelihoods but also uh, uh, rural and national economies. So maintaining these corridors and these intercropping systems can uh, also touch and tackle this issue of maintaining uh, provisioning services uh, in the future. Uh, also carbon emissions, uh, Wilson and Scholes in 2018, they have shown that converting, um, uh, especially plowing uh, for agriculture, intensifying uh, commercial agriculture, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, carbon that is lost from the soils. Remember that uh, carbon in Niambo, it's 50% in vegetation and 50% in the soil. So uh, that's a service that is lost as well with large scale uh, agriculture. As well as pollution, we need here to strengthen the uh, environmental impact assessment processes and monitoring, especially. Uh, so I'm not saying that we're not going for large scale agriculture, it's important, but those are the issues we should think about as long uh, as well as issues raised by uh, Patrick and the colleagues, okay? like labor, land conflicts, etc. and governance especially. Then biodiversity, uh, so uh, as I said, this biodiversity is very important for uh, local communities. So. Uh, what will be the best uh, farming systems that uh, maintain these corridors and this biodiversity to, um, yeah, to maintain the biodiversity. And finally, as I just said, we have to have in mind that Niambo is really a resilient system. So how we can uh, uh, expand agriculture, but at the same time uh, rely on this uh, high resilience of the Niambo in maintain this uh, or take advantage of this high resilience to um, uh, conserve the biodiversity in the world. And I guess that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you so much. Well, um, thank, thank you very I'm much, gonna... Natasha, for, for staying with us and for that um, very nice presentation. Let's go ahead and, and move quickly through the the remaining. We have, we have three, main, uh, three more discussions. Um, and uh, we'll we'll get them to speak. Please, uh, let's go with um, um, next Carson, um, please. And uh, please uh, stay within uh, ten minutes so that we have uh, some time to uh, to have general discussion and and ask questions and so forth. So thank you. Please, Carson, go ahead. Chenning, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I I have not prepared any uh, slides. Um, it would actually be helpful, I think, for the discussion if we could have a brief look at at the outlook slide of Patrick again. Would that be possible? Right. So. Um, I just need, um, because I've taken some notes, but I want to, to get a brief overview of, of which rough direction you're heading at.
you you mean the that the final outlook. side or the, the final side exactly okay. sorry i had my microphone off and and i don't know how to open it when i'm presenting uh okay this one okay okay um yeah thanks a lot um so uh yeah i'm Carsten meyer uh, i'm in glasnet uh as representative of LuckyNet, where we try to develop global land use time series but i'm also a member of geobon and primarily an ecologist so i think i have primarily the biodiversity hat on today um i um i found your studies really quite interesting uh also really like the just a the wealth of um, of work you you developed over the past years on frontier development at these different scales. Um, one thing I, I'm wondering now, of course, is how does this relate to, to biodiversity? So uh, you had much of your case studies in Mozambique now because uh, Mozambique, particularly northern, northern Mozambique, the Niassa region, is not I would say an, an international hotspot for 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 animism. Uh, it rarely features on international um, biodiversity prioritization agendas or in prioritization um, sort of maps developed by um, by High Impact Consortia. Uh, at the same time, it is regionally highly important and potentially global as 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 an area that at, until now does not have much development and therefore retains a lot of what ecologists would call wilderness or all the problematic implications there. Um, so um, how would you how would you think do the the um, the frontier processes happening explicit specifically in northern Mozambique uh, play out over the next um, couple of sort of decades and and do you think that uh, you can make any predictions regarding the speed or the average size of habitat patches lost through these processes there because both of these things would have important implications for retaining northern Mozambique's current status as sort of a, a, a reservoir of uh, of intact um, populations of large uh, carnivores and herbivores etc Would you have any expectation based on your on your modeling so far of how, how this will play out? Will we see mostly few large scale fragmentations or, or patches lost, or will we see uh, lots of small ones? And how fast will we de these develop? Um, I, I take the question now, Channing. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Or? Say, uh, okay. Uh, Karsten, why don't you go ahead and just uh, go through your your comments and Patrick can okay. note, and then yeah, yeah. Um, and That's then also you can great. respond at the end. I will, I will do that. I have notes. Yeah. Okay, but this is, well, this is uh, one aspect I would uh, consider. Uh, another one from biodiversity I would consider is that uh, Mozambique has actually fairly ambitious biodiversity policies, at least in paper compared to many other states. Um, so they're part of the High Ambition Consortium for the uh, post-2020 con uh, Convention on Biological Diversity Agenda. Um, they're also signatory of the Bonn Convention, uh, uh, which is about uh, retaining important habitats for migratory species, and particularly in the northern Mozambique region is, um, is quite crucial for the survival of uh, flagship species such as elephants or African wild dogs. Um, the Nyasa uh, Reserve, for example, is part of the Selus Nyasa Conservation Corridor extending into, into Tanzania. So um, that region has a, a fairly large responsibility for, um, for yeah, global survival of some flagship species and also um, taken up quite some responsibility in the international policy domain there. Um, if you then, I briefly looked into the national strategy of uh, Mozambique that, um, so each country that's a signatory to the, um, Convention on Biological Diversity implements a national strategy and often they're not perfectly um, temporally aligned. So the, the new um, global strategy is, is being in the final stages of discussing, but the national strategy is from 2015 to 25. And one thing they state in there is that they actually want to, by 25, define ecologically sustainable production and consumption systems 
based among other things on adequate investments. So I would see some possibility here that you might inform uh, the final stages of their, their, um, um, their current strategy um, by maybe co-informing what, uh, what these adequate investments may or may not be. Um, and um, another thing that I noted there is that already by 2020, they wanted to have all sectors uh, in biodiversity that are involved in biodiversity issues, which of course includes biodiversity loss, um, would need to take the national biodiversity targets of Mozambique as a starting point to define sectoral goals, uh, integrate those into their sectoral development plans and implement those. So whether or not this is gonna be enforced is I would say beyond my expertise, but uh, it might be an interesting uh, policy angle. Um, then uh, quickly taking on the head on, of the land use modeler before I uh, hand over to others. Um, I wondered, so from a land use modeling perspective, there are only so many additional processes that we can easily include in a, in a future land use model, because if it's too many, it gets too complex and we won't have any data to parameterize anyway. So you highlighted that in your results that, um, that different types of investors act differently and prioritize different specific determinants. But I wonder, could you maybe identify something like sort of the, the key processes that, that matter for 80% of investors and, and would help land use modelers sort of um, say, get 80% get of the frontier areas right for 80% of the frontiers, because from, a, from an inter-regional land use modeling perspective, this may be as, as good as, as we, can, we can go eventually. Um, and, and this would be very uh, helpful insights from you. Um, and then uh, a final question also regarding the sort of the key factors that you say determine the frontier development. So you looked at the past waves and failures legacies, agglomeration economies, but then also agencies, rents, which of these would you think uh, have realistic avenues to end up in models that, that try to extrapolate beyond the, the specific regional context? So we can easily measure things like uh, agglomeration economies, I would think, but can we measure or can we really get down to local agency? Um, this is another question I'd have. Um, and with that, I'd waive any remaining time if there is and uh, give more time to others. Thank you very much, Karsten. Let's move on to Rudenfika. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to um, say a few words on the, this proposed use case. Um, first of all, I would like to highlight that uh, I think the ongoing work that the team is doing, um, it is very good and generates great opportunities uh, to inform policy in Mozambique, uh, but it also presents uh, some challenges. Um, well, in this limited time that I have, uh, I would like to focus on just a few. Um, I think um, the first challenge is actually to find ways to, to maximize the synergies on the complementary approaches that actually you are proposing and, and applying right now. And I think some aspects that come to mind in thinking about uh, Northern Mozambique. Um, the first one is to acknowledge uh, the limitations of the region uh, in terms of, uh, of the region very more broadly in terms of the non-natural resource endowments and investments, particularly when it comes to the, the limited physical infrastructure that's, uh, that's in place. Uh, over the years, uh, you know, over the decades actually, there's been great efforts to actually promote uh, rural development in that particular region. But um, you know there has been a lot of a lot of uh, lack of uh, serious investments in infrastructure, particularly roads, um, electricity access, uh, te telecommunications, as well as in the development of human capital, and that to great extent limits the prospects of sustainable development and you know investments by the private as well as the public sector. Um, on the other hand, it will be really important to get some good understanding, you know, when undertaking this research uh, on the, the policies and strategies of the government at this point and looking forward on, on a time frame uh, with respect to, 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 um, to, to land use change as well as, uh, you know, broader uh, the rural development policies. So I think this is important to have in the background uh, as we do this work. 
And on the other hand, to acknowledge the, you know, the, how diverse the, the, the North Mozambique area is actually when it comes to, you know, the, both the infrastructure issues that I mentioned, as well as the, with respect to the population densities across that can actually allow for um, a successful implementation of, of investments um, where um, you know, the kind of technology adopted is gonna depend on the, uh, the, 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 the level of uh, availability of labor and also the, the network of, of roads and other things. Um, the second challenge I think is that, uh, you know, if these uh, kind of studies is, um, is um, to contribute to informed policy in Mozambique, it will have to take into account the very complex uh, social and, and economic dynamics of, of the Northern Mozambique region. That in itself, as I mentioned before, is very transgenerous across space. If you move from Yasa to, to Zambezia and Ampula, Cabo Delgado, you do have a completely different set of, 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 of situations there. And then, um, you know, it's important to account for those, those kinds of dynamics in each of the particular uh, areas. You may great, uh, get great lessons from studying uh, things in Yasa, but Yasa is very particular uh, to, to, to a great extent. And um, it has been subject to all kinds of attempts in the past um, for um, um, igniting um, the rural development, uh, particularly in terms of the agricultural uh, development. And that same is true for, for the other provinces. Um, you know, it is normally highlighted that you know, that part of the world, you know, the northern Mozambique is a region that is uh, highly uh, untouched in terms of the use of, of natural resources, and it's actually characterized by low population density, so that's true. However, um, there is also been, there are also pockets of areas where, um, that are definitely not, not untouched, and uh, where there are tensions um, uh, and claims for land and, and other resources between smallholders and the potential uh, the larger investors, uh, both domestic and foreign. Uh, one thing I've uh, realized in that region historically is that for some of the crops, uh, that kind of tension has been, um, has been uh, um, solved through the execution of the, the outgrowth schemes, particularly in cash crops, where um, you know, private companies um, that want to grow the cash crops actually do not need to remove the farmers away from the land. So that kind of tension for the land gets eased in some way. And they actually promote those outgrowth schemes to some kind of input credit, and then uh, give some uh, kind of um, um, monopsonic, um, monopsonic um, uh, rights to the to producers to actually sell all their crop to them. So in this case, situation is kind of so easy in terms of the tensions, and there are some some kind of mutual benefits to the participants in those schemes. On other cases, however, um, one has to pay very special attention to the potential for land displacement. Um, for those actual investments to be sustainable. Uh, I don't know if the, the team has uh, touched the province of Nampula and parts of Zambezia where the Pro Savara initiative uh, has been attempted to be implemented, where there are lots of, due to all these tensions, I mean, I think Pro Savara was a great, great initiative and take advantage of the experience in Brazil and the willingness of the government of Japan to financially support. It was a great combination of efforts to actually promote development in that region. But due to the, all these issues about, about the conflicts, um, given that you know, the most of the production has been mentioned before, is the small older uh, farmers, there's been a lot of issues about the uh, land conflicts and about the perceptions of, 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 of the potential for tension because of the inequalities that could be created. So as a result of that, you know, that particular initiative was not successful. So that's really very important uh, to, to keep in mind the potential for these kinds of, um, of, of, of problems. Finally, um, I would like to highlight the fact that if this, if, again, if this, um, this research is uh, going to increase the likelihood to be actually used by policymakers in Mozambique, it will be very important to identify domestic partners early in the process. Um, I see from the effort itself that there's great um, integration with the academic entities, et cetera, but it's gonna be really critical to actually try to make an alignment with the, the government of Mozambique entities that are relevant for these topics and also with the relevant private sector actors, some of which have been there long term, others are, you know, prospective investors, and uh, you know may have some interest, some attempts, and and, and uh, to some extent are not being successful so far, but maintain the interest on it. So interaction with these agents will be critical, but also with civil society, because uh, all these issues about land, for example, are very sensitive and will require a good understanding about you know what the perceptions and what the potential solutions are. And I think I will stop for here. And thank you very much. Thank you, Rui. Um, thank you, those are, uh, for all these comments. So we have a, a final uh, discussant. Uh, it's uh, Justin Johnson. Please, um, please go ahead, Justin. 
Yes, hello, and thank you everybody for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Justin Johnson. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. And I think from this perspective, uh, this pr presentation, I bring two perspectives. Um, number one, as a uh, participant in the Natural Capital Project Network among our, <clears throat> excuse me, among these GlassNet network of networks. Um, so I was you know, very interested in Natasha's presentation at the end. That was very uh, familiar looking stuff to the sort of work that I, I often find myself doing. Um, but the other angle I might be able to offer some perspective on is from thinking about at a very technical level at the, the level of linking one model's outputs as inputs into the next. Um, how do we think about this type of work and how it fits in the global local, global uh, research trajectory that we have? <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, my first observation really was just uh, a, a statement that stood out, uh, I think, really well um, that Patrick raised that um, we can get ag models that are 99% correct, but they will miss the frontier. This stood out to me because it was a great example of something where um, a sort of first pass look at a, a question might make it look like we're doing all right with our projections, but that when we start to understand something um, that is maybe not so easy to see, we could actually find out that we are making uh, really bad estimates and of critical importance from my perspective, bad policy advice. And so um, I just want to highlight that and say uh, one of the ways that it fits into this global, local, global space of research is that um, it's something that happens at one of those layers in between the global and the local. Um, and, and Patrick, I know you've thought about a lot of this, this a lot before, um, but I just wanted to flag it as a area that understanding something as you go from the global to the local, like the presence of frontiers. Um, I was wondering if you could make any comments on, um, on if you agree with this framing as a, a as it being an interesting meso level type of effect, but also if you can give any examples of where this you can do things like change the optimal policy uh, that is implied by some research. So I'd be very curious to hear more about that. Um, then uh, coming from my technical angle, um, you know, I really see a lot of potential for taking this type of work and scaling it up to the global scale um, from a technical angle. And I saw on your next step slides that you listed um, mapping agglomeration economies at global scale. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, and I was wondering if you could share more details about that. Um, but maybe another question for the, the, the full group of presenters is, are there any other areas where this type of model could be integrated into um, global scales? I mean, there's some obvious computation concerns and data concerns, but I was curious what other leads that you had maybe um, in this area. And then um, I'll try to keep it uh, short because we're running out of time and I want discussion to be a, a key part of this. But the last one I would say is um, from the perspective of what uh, Delini presented, when we talk about um, the different conceptions of social, human, and physical capital, and also that, as many people have discussed, thinking about how investors and the history of and background of those investors matters for some of the land use change uh, components. Um, to me, it strikes me that this is a great example of something that um, also operates in this, this mesoscale where um, you know, we could think about changes at the global scale, the macroeconomic scale might change which type of investors um, we have interested in a region, uh, but then the specific investors' histories and uh, the experience that they have um, is determinative for what actually ends up happening. So I was wondering if you could um, comment more on that, if perhaps there is uh, an angle for linking that type of, that component of your modeling work um, with uh, these other global models that many of us are familiar with. Um, and so I think I was under my 10 minutes on purpose so that we could save a little bit of extra time. And so I'll, I'll yield back to, to Channing to take us from here, I believe. Fantastic, thank you very much, uh, Justin. Um, so let's, uh, let's do this. Let's pass on to uh, Patrick. Um, and Delini and Christina to kind of respond to the discussant's points. I just want to add one question to Christina. I, I thought your final slide was quite interesting, but I just didn't I didn't have time to, to get it. So if, if you're if you're able to to get into that that last slide, 
uh, which was Mozambique specific. That that would be that would be fantastic, at least uh, for me. So, and then we'll move on to, to questions. So let's try to keep the. There were a lot of questions, but let's try to keep the you know responses within reasonable time. Please, um, you know, if you have a comment that you want to or a question that you want to pose, uh, then you go to reactions down at the bottom and and uh, and you can raise your hand. And, and I will try to notice that and, and call on you once uh, Patrick Delini and uh, Christina are, are, are through the first round. So please go ahead, um, team. Um, okay, so yeah, there's lots of questions. So I will probably not answer everything, et cetera, but I will try to make a few points. And then at some point we can return to more of the, the discussions questions if the, the people from the audience uh, have exhausted their questions also. But um, okay, it's a bit, of course, it's a shame that Natasha had to leave because um, she's far, far better positioned than me to answer to most of Karsten's points about biodiversity. Uh, that That is really her um, skill. But just a few reactions to that. Um, I'm back, Patty. Oh, you're back. Okay, great. Um, well, I will say a few things and then let let you you say what you you may have to say about this. But one thing is that um, yeah, northern Mozambique probably doesn't feature on a lot of these prioritization maps. But if you look even at the map of Africa, um, pretty much any kind of layer that you 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 will put, I think you will you will often easily see notice this northern Yasa. A region as standing out in terms of forest cover, low population density, presence of species, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't know exactly how it comes that it doesn't always get into the prioritization, maybe because of the threat level, but, um, but it certainly is a key area in terms of yeah, wilderness is, of course, a disputed term, but in terms of areas with relatively large tracts of habitat that, that have uh, valuable biodiversity. I think one of the things that is really important to to say, and maybe Natasha, you you can say more about this, but is that uh, biodiversity knowledge in this area is still usually lacking. So I don't know if you overlay the the, the data sets about the number of species habitats in range. I guess you will also overlay uh, the, the the amount of lack of knowledge and uncertainty that exists in these areas. And I don't have much experience on, on that, but okay, so Natasha may, may say more, but even from the field work that we've done in the region, um, we've encountered conservation biologists, et cetera, that were in expeditions that basically by going out in the mountain and staying for camping a few days, they could record a, a, a a uh, whole set of new species that were not even recorded yet. So I think part of that is is really just lack of data uh, for these these Niambu woodlands and for the region. Um, I don't know, Natasha, if you want to add something about this yeah. point. No, yeah, just a few. Uh, um, one thing um, you're right. There's a, a whole you know gap in knowledge about the biodiversity in Niambu. But I think more than that, in, in areas where we already have some data, because you know there's been several research projects and expeditions in place, uh, I think the major issue is lack of integration of that data. So we still work in silos, right? So agriculture is agriculture, forestry is forestry, and we don't integrate that data. So I think mainstreaming these uh, information, biodiversity information into uh, uh, the agricultural sector, it's very important, especially mm -hmm. the services and these services of uh, forest resources. In mm -hmm. um, on your question about how, you, how, I, uh, how we think that the dynamics will play out in the next couple of decades in this region, honestly, I have no idea. It's a super dynamic area and I think that a lot of the things that we've observed in the project are um, 
I mean, there's some, okay, that's, I think, was the point of this work about waves and legacies also, is to show that I think there's a lot, number of structural dynamics and we can try to identify these legacies. I think some of them we can map not only agglomeration economies, but some of them which are, for example, the map, the work that we've done to map these former state farms and that they actually are these hubs that attract foreign investments currently, just because these are places where you have a little bit of tiny starting point, even just a, a, a warehouse or something like that um, makes the land more, more valuable. Um, but there's these structural things, but there's so much political dynamics. I mean, the current context in terms of security, etc. I think makes it super hard. I wouldn't dare to predict what's going to happen. I think the point, somehow the goal of our work is not necessarily to, to predict that, but at least to have these different um, structural elements and these different kinds of actors um, better understood so that we can probably hopefully, and that will come to the next question, also think about what are the appropriate policies that can be robust to different kinds of, of shocks and context. Um, about your point about, uh, can we identify like the 80% investors that drive a thing? Maybe Delini, you will want to, to say something, but I, I, I think our point is precisely to show that at least in these kind of contexts where you don't have a very clear frontier process with a clear momentum and which typically, as you see in South America, would be driven by a certain crop cattle ranching frontiers, soy frontiers. I think in these areas, it's pretty easy to identify not the 80%, but probably the 90% or 95% typical investor profiles that drive most of the dynamics. I think here it's not the case because I think all the people are struggling to identify what can work. But um, still with what Delini has shown, I, I think it's still possible to identify maybe not 10, but three, four types of typical profiles of investors that may be hard to quantify what is exactly their importance in the landscape. But I think we can at least say, okay, there's the kind of no expertise investors that look for land that's expect, that is expected to gain values and is more speculative behavior, but they don't really know what to do with this land. There's kind of super skilled investors which are looking for the specific niche agroecological conditions to produce high value crops that they want to export. So there's a few of these profiles that maybe we can try to, to, um, to identify, to typify in a sense. I don't know, Delini, if you want to add on this. No. Delini, no, you okay. Um, should I? Um, how oh. I going to finish? Sorry. Should I? Should I add uh, add now, or are you going to finish if, for the whole? If you no, no, I maybe if you want to add a, a bit on this point. Okay. Um. So okay. So I think. Uh, do we have a figure for? Where do we know eighty percent would invest? The short answer is no, but I would rather tend to say that it's a much more nuanced answer that we have. For example, this is something actually we talk about in the paper, uh, trying to understand and overlap with like how and where people go and whether we could sort of like align this with conservation planning. This was another question. So I'm just throwing in that as well. So like, you know, you have priority areas and you have uh, less prioritized areas and you something that you also said, Kasten, is like this some of these areas do not feature high in 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 in, in uh, biodiversity hotspots. So it's 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 just to say like probably we can't say that they can't go anywhere. So but you could just come up with a strategy where you know that that there, there, there is some zoning also for investments, just like we do conservation, and that might work. And in that sense, I guess like. Uh, when we said like we do identify where investors are most likely to go in in those two dimensions that we discussed about so resource frontiers and agglomerations so they are most likely to go to um, subsistence frontiers if you look at forestry because they are 
taking vast expanses, they're, they're, they're growing more into sort of populated smallholder land. And if you for a moment forget uh, biodiversity and try to prioritize, like, because the, the, the impacts on, on people, people displacement is the, is the biggest discourse in, in these parts of the world. So you might see that forestry investments going in that area, and then you might need to plan for that. So, so, so I guess I would tend to say it's, it's, we could probably pull out the answer for, for what you suggest, but it's also um, one thing we need to remember in, in Africa is that really the, the, the sample of, or the pool of investors investing there is quite small. It's not big. Um, and then they're quite heterogeneous. So yeah, mm -hmm. if I add to that, yes. Yeah, um, maybe to, to just bridge directly to, to one of the, 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 the points or question from, from Justin. Um, at, I do think that it would be super interesting and that it would somehow make sense. I, I don't think that it's necessarily easy, but um, uh, to, 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 to do a bit, and that's what we had a bit in the slide, but to do a bit what, what you were suggesting to say, if we have an idea of this kind of diversity of portfolio of investors, we could think of scenarios that are linked to global macroeconomic context and climate and I, I don't think that it's necessarily just um, scenarios that will be based on quantitative variable, like, I don't know, global interest rate or something like that, because I think these investors, some of them react to that, but also linked to um, shift in priorities regarding impact investments or uh, something that we've, we've seen also on, 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 on the ground, um, like global health uh, policies related, for example, tobacco companies, being very frightened about the investment context where they, 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 they really have trouble to find uh, money from investors uh, because uh, tobacco is not a really a, a fashionable um, thing for the moment. And, um, and, and, and it is uh, coming to, to, to respond in terms of outgrowth schemes. For example, tobacco is still the major, um, one of the major um, crops in the, in the region. So we could try to think about how it would be possible to, to think maybe quantitatively, maybe qualitatively, at least about how these different um, scenarios, uh, like changes in the global conditions, et cetera, would favor the presence of more or less of these kinds of, of investors. Je, je... Um, donc, um, but, um, one, yeah, well, maybe one other point. I'm, I'm jumping a bit back and forth between the different questions, uh, but to try to cover uh, different things. Uh, about Rui's point, two, two things. One is um, we are, I think, we try to be extremely careful and, and aware about the, um, the diversity of the context and the context specificities of the, the, and the diversity within the region. That's why we try to, to be cautious when we, we report findings on YESA versus finding on in another place to try to not generalize beyond what we can say. And that's what, what is the goal also of looking at these different scales, of course, is that to see, okay, we have an in-depth investigation in one province, then we have a sample of investors across the broader regions. What are the kind of insights that we see in one place that somehow hold in a larger area, um, et cetera. So we, we, we try to be very careful about, about that. Um, just one point maybe, and then uh, maybe on that, maybe Delini or Christina, you, you may also add to that, but um, about um, like, what we can say about policies for, for Carson points about ecologically positive investments or for, for response about different ways to resolve the tensions between local populations, smallholders and, and commercial agriculture, uh, outgrowth schemes, etc. Uh, at this point, we don't have a lot of answers to that yet, but of course, this is really something that we, we want to contribute more, but um, we really believe that is that there's a, a value in, in doing what we have done, which is to try to build a knowledge base before trying to go too quickly into the policies. But one of the things that we saw in the study, in, and that's related to these, these stories about waves, is that we have this new wave of 
medium scale farmers, commercial farmers, which are partly from outside the region, partly from within the region, which are um, so they are yeah more more rooted in the in the in the, the region of North and Mozambique. Some come from the region, some have worked in the region for some times. Many of them they invest their own savings, but they try to 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 top that uh, to to com combine that with um, with external investors' money, etc. They build relatively medium scale farms, not the huge uh, many thousand hectares of farms with a monocropping, but more um, more larger, uh, more medium scale farms with diverse crops, etc. Um, and I, um, we have some some insights, some ideas that they may have been reflecting the the, um, the relationships with small orders around in a different way than some previous ways. For example, they have they tend to be less mechanized and to hire more labor from the, the, the local communities. Um, so I think one of the, the lessons that we may want to highlight is that there, there may be ways, if you look at these farmers, there may be ways to think about relatively medium, large scale, commercial, financial investments in agriculture that can have more positive outcomes for local livelihoods and for sustainability of agriculture than the, the, the classic investment. So just to say that that we don't have the answer, but we, we have hints that there are different models and that there, that there is a possibility to dig deeper into that. I don't know if Christina uh, Delini, you, you want to add on this and maybe I will, we can stop there because I see that there's question in the chat and maybe question from the audience. Um, so if I can add a couple of points to what Patrick was saying to um, some of the questions raised by Justine and Kasten and also um, probably not so much uh, by Natasha because, um, um, yeah, so ecology is not an aspect that we looked at in, in, in the studies that we defined, but um, something that was um, from the going to the, um, the local scale to the global scale um, and, and, and the fact that uh, the, the, the the global level uh, determinants or the global level forces and and the and the various sort of track records of the in investors. So going back to that, I guess it's quite interesting if you get if you take the same modeling approach to the global level, you would see a whole bunch of investors who'd be investing all over the globe, right? And and when you see that, you see that the the the, the investors would have specific regional affiliations. So who the, the investors who go into Africa, you see that most of them are European, you know. Uh, and 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 then so with such affiliations and then that's also where you see um, things like governance becoming important important right people say governance is important but if it's if it's the, a similar bunch of investors going to Africa you see that like to like governance is not so much difference um, uh, within these African countries if you take the, the within group difference differentiation right so so then people do not really take into account because what we are looking at is about a group of investors who are specifically focused on Africa and they are they might not even consider going to um, Australia or, or to Latin America you do have very big companies like the, the the big four that they talk about in Latin America but but the ones that we see most of them in Africa are so they are they're geared towards sort of like they're already decided that they are going to go into Africa. So what we've modeled it happens within that. But if you take a step back and look at the global perspective, then you will see these global forces becoming important, right? Most of the investors who went to Africa during that time and who have failed, so they're not really there anymore, most of them, went there because after their investments in the in failed uh, during the 2007-8 financial crisis. So, so with that, you see that there are global forces sort of informing their decisions. But the moment you look at, 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 at a, like a homogeneous group in that sense, as in like, okay, we've decided to go to Africa. And, and within that group, you see that some of these uh, global forces don't matter and um, some of the local forces matter. So that's how I guess the, the scale plays in that. And if I add to the question about um, how do we uh, plan to, so, so Karsten's question, 
uh, agri mapping agri agglomerations could be easy? Actually not, because we do not have the data. And this goes back to Justin's question. So what are the limitations? Uh, actually taking this model to the global level, that's why Patrick was, I guess, suggesting that how do we take it to the global level? One of the limitations that we would have is data, because uh, these are investment decisions where we spoke to people for like two hours and asked, like, why did you go to this place? You know, not to this land, but that to that land. And this level of sort of rich data where investors talk to you about two hours about why wh what happened and how many they made the decisions. You don't have this kind of data at the global scale. And something that we are proposing and actually seriously considering is whether we could pull, uh, bring together uh, researchers who have been working uh, on the ground in different parts, who have done interviews. Probably we wouldn't have the same set of variables, but if we could bring these uh, uh, interviews together, probably we could do something not as great as some of the work that you do at GTAP, but something in between. And to agglomerations, we actually do not have agglomeration economy data, uh, economies data. Uh, what we used in this model is also really market access. And then we tried to sort of proxy it with uh, field sizes. But uh, this agglomeration, the idea of like, for example, if you're talking about fruit industries, where are the packing industries? You know, where are the packing houses? Where are the logistics? And if you talk about forestry, where are the, um, uh, where are the places where do the sawmills so are? So these type of spec industry specific agglomerations we do not know. So this is one reason why we were thinking of sort of like if we could actually map this at a global scale. So we were proposing, uh, what do you call it, Patrick? I forget the name. Um, uh, crowdsourcing effort, uh, a global crowdsourcing effort to map these industry specific agglomerations. So we brought a big team together from all over the world, uh, but we are lacking the funding. So we are looking for funding. So that's also something that we are going to do. I guess I will leave it at that. Okay. Um, maybe either um, Christina, you want to take Channing's question on the Mozambique and impact evaluation study, or Channing, you prefer to take questions from the audience. I'll leave it to you to, to decide. Christina, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, Tom's put up a question. If anybody has a question, please either raise your hand or put it in the, in the chat for the moment. Let's go forward with Christina. Yeah, Channing, your question was to just uh, deepen uh, a bit on the Mozambique case that I presented at the end, right? Yeah, the, the the final slide there. You, I, I didn't quite, I didn't get it. I, I just, just too. That, that's yeah, the one. So, I didn't, I didn't understand what you, what, what that graph on the right is showing. Yeah. So this is. So we are now putting together the pieces that Patrick presented before on the. So the remote sensing team put together a map of forestry investments. And we have we are combining this these maps, the census of the forestry investments with household data uh, for 2007 and 2017. So basically, we are doing a regression discontinuity design to evaluate the impacts of this expansion of forestry investments on smallholder uh, welfare, basically on employment and productivity. Um, so, so basically those circles are um, for the regression discontinuity to see, um, so we're thinking of, uh, you know, if the investment happened uh, close to the households, uh, how large it expanded and for how long. So the, the length of exposure to these investments and then uh, compare uh, the effects on, on time. Mm -hmm. Um, this is work in progress, so we don't have yet results to show, but I think the results will inform uh, a bit of the questions that were also asked, I think, um, on like what are adequate investments, right? So um, we hope to, all, I mean, it's as future avenues also to combine with the types of investors and maybe these, I mean, like linking with the work that Delini presented on the different you know, heterogeneities of these types of investors that maybe would enlighten some possible heterogeneities of where where is it working and, and why and where the where where is it? Great. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, um, Christina. Um, are there um, any any questions more from the um, from the from the audience? Um, I have a I have a question if if there's if there is not, and there are also a, a comment by 
by Tom, I think, in terms of future directions, but I think we perhaps have dealt with that one in the in the chat. Um, so I, I was going to ask just about uh, you know payments for environmental services and and what the level of interest is and whether that's something you all are 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 looking at um, in the Mozambique context. Payment for ecosystem services. Yeah, um, yeah I think there are some um, some pilot schemes that are implemented uh, in Zambesia. Maybe Natasha, you know more, more because I, I think uh, Professor Almeida Sito uh, has been working on that and the Red Plus uh, scheme. Um, I'm not sure how much more there is. There is certainly a potential for that, but um, yeah, but if you're right, there's a potential for that, and the there's some um, initiatives on the ground, like related to Red Plus or the carbon market. It's the main ecosystem service now being. I don't know if you are aware of the uh, the Zambezia landscape restoration program, uh, so which is a Red Plus uh, uh, program. But uh, the thing is that we don't, a part of the Red Plus, we don't have any regulations on that. There's now the new forest policy, uh, new forest policy, which includes um, these uh, ecosystem services, payment, payment for ecosystem services, but we haven't moved yet. The forestry law, it's under discussion now, but there's nothing still we're trying to push to include that. But so there's no non on on regulations. So that will be probably probably the main limitation on moving forward on that. Just I'm just excluding now the red plus. Red plus is in place. We have the regulation and initiatives on the ground. Great. Well, okay. Um, thank you. Um, let me thank the uh, first the presenters for some, some very interesting presentations. Um, and then the discussants for uh, a series of, of uh, pointed comments. Um, I thought the discussion was, was with the discussion points were also uh, very good. Um, and then many thanks to the um, participants who've come and uh, listened uh, to this, to this, uh, this workshop.